In short, segregated urban planning has left very deep scars on generations of Cape Tonians. It has also created a troubling network of physical divisions, staggering to look at from up here. It's a citywide urban fingerprint of a once dominant racist ideology. More than 20 years after the end of official segregation, people still live within the spatial separation implemented during apartheid. Whites are in the downtown and the rich suburbs. Blacks and colored stay in their designated townships. In and around these townships, people have ended up building informal settlements with no property deeds and, more often than not, no basic services. But hey, you have to live somewhere. Raise your kids, build a home. There are, are you ready for this? 437 informal settlements in Cape Town. 437. I meet Sizwe Moksobo in PJS, an informal settlement in the township of Kailicha, one of South Africa's largest. PJS is short for Section P Joe Slovo. Because like many other informal settlements, the place was named after an anti-apartheid activist. And this one, Joe Slovo, was a former housing minister in the Mandela government. To this day, PJS is still not considered permanent, even though it was established in 1989. So you have your central CBD and moving out, all those places close to the city, that's White. your whites only. Yeah. And then second, you've got your colored area. Now let's set at the edge of the city. Let's set all the blacks here. Mm -hmm. So even today, if you go on N2 around the city, you will see every time when you cross a bridge, you get a different setting. Mm -hmm. And that setting could start spelling out who lives there, the type of planning that's happening there, what's allowed to happen there. Sizwe was born and raised in a similar neighborhood in the township of Nianga. Despite poverty and racism, he has now become a successful urban planner and still lives in an informal settlement, just like 25% of his fellow Cape Tonians. There's no paved roads, mm -hmm. there's no planned pathways. This is a negotiated pathway okay. that we see here. And this would have been left over time by people saying, okay, this works as a main road. Yeah. But there's no formal services. Right. Then obviously the building material is more your, your, your zinc yeah. and wood material. So it's not your formal brick and mortar structures. Okay. And people are not allowed to build or to use that type of material because then it would signify some sort of permanency. The view over this, this is temporal living of some sort. Yeah. So there's the planned township, mm -hmm. which will have your formal houses. But then there'll be other stuff that's planned within the planned township that would live these open spaces that we see. Right. So if you look there, ah. that's the formal houses there. Right. This would have been a pocket maybe left for a business zoning, right? But no business ever came in. So there's then the informal settlement, which grows out of the people's need to create their own spaces. <laughs> <laughs> What are they saying, Abelung, Abelung, and shouting and really happy? Yeah. But what they're saying is white people, white people. And it's because of that apartheid planning. Because yeah. you never see white people on this side of town. But it's not negative, it's positive. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, a celebration of Oh my God, it's a white guy, uh, yeah, uh, all right, okay. Yeah, boy, yes. So that celebration coming from the fact that there's not integration happening. We're, you know, we're walking around all the beautiful kids and you know, sure. it's kind of, it's a, it's, it seems friendly, it seems very life-sized oh, as yeah. well. Uh, I mean, how dangerous is this uh, informal settlement if we're talking gangs or crime? <laughs> And so they, there's your everyday robbery, right? From the youth, there's lack of activities mm -hmm. or lack of jobs. So, but then again, it, it, it's not that dangerous. During the day, it's fine. The problem is during the night okay. when darkness comes because then there's no easy security around it to look. So people will lock themselves behind their yards and create their own private space. Right. So security is a challenge because there's a lot of gaps in between the houses. For criminals, it's easy to just do something here and disappear throughout. What about lighting? That huge, yeah, Light pole. There's also another one right there. Ah, Who yep. put those in? Government. Like there's toilets here mm -hmm. to try and say, okay, we'll we'll bring in flush toilets, but those are communal toilets. Yeah. The problem is in the accounting, though. Policy says one toilet for five shacks, right? Yeah. It doesn't take into account how many people live in those five shacks ah, wow. to share one. I think we can agree that toilets are well a basic human necessity. Here in PJS, they are few and far between. Only 114 toilets for 900 households. Most of them are either temporary, broken, or isolated. And this, of course, can lead to major issues. 
For obvious sanitary reasons, you don't want a toilet near where your kids play. On the other hand, if they're too far from the shacks, you risk being mugged, raped, or even killed. Just going to the bathroom. For me, growing up pre-1994, as an, as an 80s kid, right? Mm -hmm. when, so I started wondering, what would it take to, to shift this informality and make it formal? Why can't we be upgraded where we are, is what drove me from primary school to high school to come and study town planning, which I wouldn't lie, I had no clue that a profession such as town planning existed. Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> but you come from a place where really everybody's a town yeah. planner, right? You're all contributing to, uh, to building uh, the, the neighborhood and oh, yeah. uh, keeping it safe. In my time when I was at CBT, there was never much being taught about looking at informality right. as a way. So the traditional thinking was still there. You deal with informal settlement by moving everyone mm. and planning a new settlement. Sizwe, through his work with a local NGO called DAG, the Development Action Group, proposes what he calls re-blocking. This involves reimagining the settlement with members of the community so it can better fit their needs. Together, they design a new layout by moving a few shacks, adding a road, creating a courtyard for kids to play, planting a food garden, installing clotheslines. They also make sure the government has enough space to install basic services like running water, electricity, and toilets. There's a lot of space in between. Mm -hmm. So how do we consolidate that space? How do we reorganize the shape of the shack mm -hmm. so that it makes it more functional to achieve more? Yeah. So how do we optimize the space that we have? If mm -hmm. we can uh, move people around, then we can actually have the walkway around there. And that's our sewer. As we don't have toilets around here, which we can open the toilets around here, I mean, or is the community willing to do that, to be That's moved around? That's actually one, one of the things that we are going to propose to the community. Okay. Also, if you see here, this is an a, a old building. There's no one who's staying there. So uh -huh. we see that this can, we can use as a community facility for our youth, because our youth don't have the, the, the hall whereby they can show their talent. So mm -hmm. we can use this building as our community facility. Do you feel that, that you can change things yourself now, now that you are focusing on, on, on this? I think so. That's my hope. It's your hope? That's are my are hope. you optimistic when you start focusing on this? Yes. For me, I think I've, I've come from saying maybe the biggest thing that we need is to get everyone, especially the community level, believing in them, themselves to bring change. Because then if we expect it to come from the outside, that's going to take another 10 years, 20 years. Mm. But if we can get people to have, who have protest to start creating their own plans and saying, look, this is what we want. Can, can we, and for the time being, while we're still waiting for things to be better, while we're still waiting and trying to figure things out, can, can we work on this? Can we see how, 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 what negotiations can we take? That for me is the start of creating that change. But we need to get the people creating their own change. When you live in an informal community like here in PJS in Cape Town, or anyone like it anywhere else in the world, and the municipality refuses to acknowledge your existence, or perhaps just reluctantly does so, empowering the community to gather information, to map out the place, to collect data, is proof of life. And that provides not only hope, but dignity. And that is a powerful place to start working towards change. <laughs>